In 2019, Joffre Archer held his nerve in the Super Over as England won their first ever Cricket World Cup. It was one of the greatest moments in the history of English cricket. And a black man stood front and centre. However, since my last Test match in 2004, only four black players have played for the England men's cricket team. And in the last 25 years, the number of black professional cricketers has dropped by 75%. So, what's been going on? History is written by the conqueror, not by those that are conquered. Got him. That was quick. Mark Butcher is through to his hundred. We need to go back and teach both sides of history. I'm Mark Butcher. I was lucky enough to play 71 test matches for England between 1997 and 2004, making me England's most capped black test cricketer. My maternal grandparents came over to England in the early 50s as part of the Windrush generation. In 1954, my mother Elaine was born in Camberwell, just a stone's throw away from where I would watch my father Alan play cricket for Surrey at the Oval. During the course of making this film, I've met with some of England's most successful and recognisable black cricketers. Some of the stories I've heard have been heartwarming and in some cases, shocking. It all started just over 40 years ago, 1980, Edgbaston, in a one day international against Australia. England awarded a cap for the very first time to a black man. Roland Butcher. Yes! Well, I was really pumped up and looking forward to it. You know, when you get your first call up, um, you can't wait to get started. So, you know, it was a great opportunity um, for me. I ended up getting 52, and also we went on to win the game. I remember actually writing a letter, Roland Butcher, England cricket team, and I hope it got to him, just encouraged him, say, look, come on, Roland, you know, you can do it, you know, because I was so proud to, to see him out there, because I, and I knew what it meant, you know, for, for him to be playing for England and for other, you know, kids like myself. Because you see somebody that looks like you, that comes from somewhere like you, and you see him achieving it, it just adds a little more confidence to your belief that you can do it. You took personal pride from another West Indian, even though you didn't know them, because your feeling was is that we were all kind of lumped together. For all these guys, uh, their lives would have had a lot of disruption almost from the day they were born. There was trauma, disruption uh, and difficulty almost from the word go. Hope at that time for so many people involved leaving. I was always going to the UK. I was born 68. Um, a short time after that, my dad had already left to go and try to better the family. It was that sort of environment where people were leaving. They weren't abandoning anybody. All of us knew it was an opportunity. Your parents are leaving you. They've gone. And you sort of got over it and then <laughs> Then you're leaving, you get on a plane, leaving your grandmother behind, and then suddenly you arrive in cold winter. It just felt alien to me. I was aware that I was different. I stuck out. That afro wasn't the one that everybody was wearing. Those features, those large lips and not so small nose, were in an environment where nobody paid any attention to that because that was normal, became a little bit of an issue. We all like it when we feel comfortable, where we know where we stand, we know where we fit in. But coming to the UK, all these guys and, and, and girls from the Caribbean didn't really know where they fitted in. People say you look back to your childhood, but mine was tough, mate. 
you know, there was seven boys, my mum and dad, in a two-bedroom flat, basically. My father, he was an alcoholic, he drank. Um, he got quite aggressive as well. The memories are just sometimes hiding in the room, just hiding and waiting. My two, three elder brothers always protected. I owe them whatever career I've had, I owe that to them. The only time I felt good about myself or felt great was when I was out playing cricket or football, really. I remember the first game I played at Wilson High. It was the first time I'd actually played on a turf wicket. And I remember looking around and to me, the outfield was immaculate. That afternoon, I felt like Viv Richards. During the 70s and 80s, the West Indies were more than just everybody's second favorite cricket team. To black folk in the UK, watching Viv, Clive and co allowed them to celebrate their culture in public in ways that they felt unable to do in everyday life. It was 76 the Oval. When I saw these guys, they walked out so proud. Like, you know, it's not like they were renting the ground for the day, it's like they owned the ground. This man walked towards me. I thought he was gonna come down the field. He turned around and ran in and bowled. It was Michael Olden. And what a great delivery. I just walked away thinking, I want to be a fast bowler, Dad. So that's what I want to do. I want to play cricket. And beautifully placed. This man Richards is so quick on his feet. It was just a time where everyone was inspired by these guys. All of our dreams was to be cookies. Because from where we were, that was the pinnacle of life. These guys stood so tall. I think a lot of Caribbean people, you know, who have been living in England for a long time, who didn't have anything to shout about. All of a sudden, you know, there's this amazing team of players. The pride they had in, in watching them perform, it meant a lot. Each match, you would start at naught for naught, and it was a level playing field. It was just about how good your skills were on that pitch. And game after game, the West Indies were able to show that their skills were better than the opposition's. And for a black person watching that, um, cheering that, it made you feel like you were better than what other people thought you were. Cunningham, and he's away again to show that pace and grace and control. On for Regis. Whilst cricket provided a sense of sanctuary to the UK's West Indian population, there was open hostility in the country at large and on the football terraces in particular. As a kid, Dean Headley was a season ticket holder at West Bromwich Albion, a club that helped inspire generations of black footballers in the UK. When Laurie Cunningham, Brendan Batson and Cyril Regis played together in the late 70s, it was the first time a club had regularly fielded three black players and for Dean, Cyril Regis was more than just an inspiration. He was a friend of mine when I played club cricket up down up uh, North Staffordshire for Leeset. You know, he turned up, he used to come and watch my games and he was just such a calming person. When he walked in the room, he had presence about him, always commanded attention. And build up and Batson crossed that in again. He can, it's a good one. Regis! They had struggles, I mean, Bananas thrown, chants that you just unbelievable back then. Chanting the M word, shoot them. I watched them go through horrendous stuff here and um, how they coped. I'm not sure people would cope like that today. Until I came to England, I didn't know about racism. I noticed it, first of all, when I moved to Leicester as a 17-year-old, where I saw people clutching their bags tightly as they walked and actually crossed the street to avoid me. And when I looked back, they crossed back. I didn't quite know where I belonged um, because we were constantly be told, go home, go home. And you're thinking, this is my home. I'm born here. This is my country. 
there's that feeling that in some way, shape or form, people think that you're less. So all of a sudden, you're now a little bit more aware that things aren't necessarily all equal. It would be comforting to think that cricket was immune from the racism that was pervasive in the UK at the time. That simply wasn't the case. There's the other side to it, which people don't see, where you receive, you know, I don't know, lost count of how many letters uh, from the National Front um, saying, you know, if you turn up at the ground, you play for England, we'll get a sniper and shoot you and will also kill your family. I'm receiving this two, three days before I go down to play a test match. One incident, I can remember, I drove down to Lords. The proudest moment where you've been selected, you want to go and play for England, but I, on the back of my mind, I'm thinking, do I really want to now? Police are outside my house, looking after my house. I was a shambles, mate. The only way I felt I could beat it was just to play. I never shared it with anyone. I never said anything to anyone, only the chief exec at the club. The information I was given was just, just to ignore it, forget it. You know, it. And that's what we always said, to ignore and forget those things. Yeah. But it's very hard to. Taking the first over, I'm sort of stood there thinking, when's the sniper coming? And all through the five days, I'm thinking something's going to happen. They say we have a chip on our shoulder. It's not a chip on our shoulder. It's the things you've experienced. I remember my first away game at Gloucestershire. Somebody knocks on my door in the evening, I look, and one of my teammates leave a banana skin there. And, and then subsequently that person I have to play with for the next 13, 14 years. When I was in that room and that happened to me, I said, I'm gonna be harder, tougher than ever. Nobody's ever gonna push me around. You always felt like you're fighting. People made judgments on you. You're just battling all the time, you're battling, you know, you're just thinking, you know, is this ever going to be right? I'm seeing those things day in, day out, and nothing's been done about it. I'd hate to think that a youngster these days would have a path anyway similar to mine. Monty Allen Lynch, born Guyana, 1958, played over 350 first-class matches for Surrey and a hero of mine as a kid. He, along with Lonsdale Skinner, wicketkeeper batsman, and terrifying quick bowler Sylvester Clark, were a magnet to the local Caribbean community around the Oval in the 70s and 80s. Lons had already warned me about what to expect and how to conduct myself and keep looking over your shoulders, especially from the racial point of view. When it really hit home to me, we were sitting around, uh, and I said, listen, I want to play for England. Back came from the assistant coach. Well, are you going to work that out? We're right if you got playing for England. And I said, What do you mean? He said, Well, where were you born? You should be on the railway, McDonald's, and a poor hospital porter. That's what you should be doing, not talking about playing for bloody England. But play for England, he did. Monty would win three one day international caps in 1988 against the West Indies. And later on that year, David Sid Lawrence would become the first UK-born black man to play for England. I remember making my debut for England at Lords. Oh, well done. Well done. Good cricket from Lawrence. You never feel you were a trailblazer for it all, but you felt that, you know, hopefully you could make a difference. From playing in the streets and playing, you know, um, schools cricket, and then when you get that final call, say you actually are going to play for England, it's kind of surreal. You know, the day goes, the five or six, seven days goes too quick for you to remember it, but I just remember just being so proud for my parents more than anything else. They were the ones I was happy for, my mum and... They were so proud. Really proud, you know. So, 
for me, it was all that hard work for them. Because I knew it meant a lot to them. So, yeah, yeah, it was, um, yeah, my proudest moment, definitely. Definitely. During the 70s and 80s, these men all suffered personal upheaval and discrimination, and yet still found the strength and resilience to reach the very pinnacle of their sport. Perhaps more importantly, they inspired the next generation to believe that anything was possible. There is a truth to the idea that you can't be what you don't see. Ball him, he's got him! I never felt I didn't get anywhere because of my colour. Got him! The guy I played cricket with for a very long time, he said, I would be bloody horrified if my kids speak to your kids the way I used to speak to you. History is written by the conqueror, not by those that are conquered. We need to go back and teach both sides of history. England's plane arrived half an hour late. Ahead of these tourists, three months of almost non-stop cricket. When England flew out to tour the West Indies in 1990, the numbers were rising. By now, there were 17 England-eligible black players in the county championship, four of which were on the plane to face the greatest side that had ever played the game. There is a truth to the idea that you can't be what you don't see. The fact is that actually what you do see acts as an inspiration. And so to see black players playing for England, that, that's the dream. If there's one place I wanted to play, it was that then, and my granddad was still alive. They wanted to press one, wanted to do, wanted to do the story, and so I remember taking taking them to my to where I grew up, my grand my granddad in his veggie plot with the cane fields, and I took and I took along my my cap and England sweater. So it was me, my granddad standing in the corner of his sugar cane field. He's wearing my England blazer and cap, and it's the only time I've ever seen him with tears in his eyes. A crowd here which have come to see the West Indies feast on the delights of a good Sabina Park pitch. This crowd were vociferous, man. They absolutely nailed me. And if I weren't strong enough, they would have broken me. But guess what? One of the best things happened to me on that tour getting the Master Blaster out in the first innings. Oh, big appeal there, but he's got it, he's got it! Oh, yeah. Luke Richards going for the full shot, and Devon Malcolm has struck a mighty blow for England. I was just embarrassingly happy. Who's this guy? Got Luke Richards out once, but twice? No, 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 no. That doesn't happen very often. All of a sudden, all the hostility I've been getting on the boundary from the Sabrina crowd, they yeah, readapted me. Well, his hero is back in the pavilion, and I'm sure he doesn't like it. That's why he's biting his nails. He's a bit uh, unsure of the result and what's going to happen to his heroes. He's bowled him. Markham's fourth wicket. And the West Indies have lost another wicket. It's got him. Out at second slip. Devon and Gladstone shared eight wickets in the second innings, and England, against all odds, had managed to do something that no test side had done in 35 years, beat the West Indies in Jamaica. Great for the spectators, astonishing for England, astonishing for the West Indies too, they cannot believe it. After their heroics in Sabina Park, England would go on to lose a test series 2-1. But in the one-day international series that followed, Christopher Claremont Lewis, would make his international debut.
Chris Skirts. Very bright, interesting young man. Born in Guyana, left till he was 10 years old. It's the way I would have wanted it, the way I would have imagined it if I could. It was back in the Caribbean. It was against the West Indies. It was in Trinidad. Roti, curry, music, calypso, everybody shouting, everybody screaming. So much going on that you don't think it's possible to concentrate, yet you're focused and at the same time taking it all in. What a great day this is for Chris Lewis. And he's got him, he's out, caught behind, yes. He's got the outside edge there, straight through to Jack Richards, and the youngster has struck on his birthday. Listen, my aunts, my cousins, the ones from back home, it's little Chrissy, yeah? Not Christopher, Chrissy. For them to see little Chrissy left Guyana, come to England, and to come back as an England player. Oh, it was a thing. I never thought I'd share a cricket field with these guys. I never thought that little Chrissy would be bowling to Desmond Haynes, to Gordon Greenwich. I think that moment informed so much more of my life in the sense that it showed me unequivocally that I could have what I want, that I could dream what I want, and it would come through. Remember, you can achieve. Remember, you can be that guy. England v South Africa, the Oval, 1994. One of the greatest fast bowling performances of all time. I was really fired up. Bold him. One of the most fiery deliveries you'll see in a long, long time. Just wicket after wicket after wicket. Gone and another one. And another one. Bold him. Nine wickets for Malcolm. On that day, Dev had everything. The pace, skill, control, aggression. It was just, just one of the greatest performances by an English cricketer of all time. However, when Pictor to tore South Africa in 1995 against a team he had torn apart only a year before, instead of being treated as the ace in England's pack, he found himself undermined and belittled. Everybody, it seemed, could see the value in Devon Malcolm, except his own management. I'm there, getting ready, in my run up, just about to bowl. When I heard <laughs> helicopter on, stop the game. President Mandela turned up. On seeing Devon Malcolm, the president recognized him, calling him the Dark Destroyer, a special moment for the pace man. I said to him, I'm here to mash you guys again. There won't be no holding up. I'm here to do exactly the same what I did to you at the Oval. But in a press conference at the start of the tour, Coach Ray Ellingworth was quoted as saying of Devon, the way he is bowling, he wouldn't frighten me, let alone the South Africans. And bowling coach Peter Lever offered, Devon has one great asset, his pace. The rest of his cricket is a non-entity. Here's a guy who should be lauded and an inspiration really around that, that dressing room. And he's being treated almost like a, like a schoolboy. Easiest thing for me then was to say, thank you, I'm off the tour. But who am I to do that? A black man, only black man on the tour. No way, not when Nelson Mandela spent so much years in prison. It was tough, it was tough. Well, there's a big shout. Has he nicked it? Yes, the finger goes up. Devon Malcolm gets his reward. 
Despite taking six wickets in the second test at Johannesburg, Devon would be dropped from the side and would only play a handful more test matches for England. By the mid-1990s, the number of black English players in the county championship had doubled to 33. But instead of celebrating the game's increasing diversity, Wisden Cricket Monthly, known to many as the game's Bible, would publish an article that would outrage England's West Indian-born players and many more people besides. <sighs> well, I tell you what, that made me feel really, really bad. The article, titled Is It in the Blood, questioned the commitment of England's foreign-born black players, referring to them as Negroes and interlopers. The guy who wrote the article, he didn't understand or appreciate what you know, you've gone through and, and, and how much it means to you playing for England. Do you even play sports? Do you? Ask one of my brothers. In fact, ask my little brothers if I've ever let them win at anything. And here you are suggesting that in an international match against people I don't know, I would let them win. You get that, that people think that you're a different breed. When you're representing yourself, your country, your people, you've got to care. And you hurt when, when you have a bad day. You know, you know you haven't done, done real well. No, you don't need to re read a paper or to let someone shout from the, the stands. You're the first person that knows that. The thing that hurt me the most, it was a picture of me at the front of it. And I just, I could not accept that. And I looked at it and I just thought it was just, you know, it, it was racist. It was specific at the uh, black guys. And I keep saying, look, that is terrible. We can't let this go ahead. Malcolm and Defreitas sued and won damages, which they donated to charity. Wisden apologised, accepting they had made an error of judgement. Speak to any black player and they will tell you that the same stereotype has existed throughout their amateur and or professional careers. The perception that they are lazy relies solely upon natural ability and have little or no understanding of the game. Lately, I've seen those accusations levelled at Joffre Archer, just as I saw them pointed at Chris Lewis back in my playing days. I didn't really know what they were saying, and that might sound a strange thing to say. I was just moving, I was just running. I was just trying to get the ball. I was just running for the ball, trying to catch the ball, trying to throw the ball to the best that I could do it. A lot of questions being placed on Chris Lewis about his commitment, about his temperament. Here's a strange thing. It's literally in the last five years I've started watching quite a bit of cricket of myself. And I look and I go, OK, I see. Now I get it. I didn't know that. I didn't see that. I was just doing my thing. Would you have any advice for somebody like Joffre Archer? I've called it sort of borderline racist abuse that he gets. I would say that if you're that person, it tends to come your way because perhaps what comes with it is a lack of understanding from everybody else because they don't understand how you can make it look so easy. In order to, for me to bowl 70 miles an hour, I've got a burst to gut. And there you are, just rolling your arm over. Surely you've got more left there, you lazy bugger. <laughs> it was a situation where perhaps they didn't understand me and what they were seeing, but I couldn't understand their reaction to me as well. And that's the way to do it. What a magnificent way to reach your first Test 100. Mark Ramprakesh, 100. Throughout the 90s and early noughties, players of Afro-Caribbean heritage would regularly deliver for England when it mattered, both with the bat and with the ball. And in the 1998 Boxing Day Test match, Dean Headley would have his moment in the Melbourne Sun. It defines me. Everybody who talks to me talks about Melbourne and that last session. It's got to be very, very close. It's kept low and back. Ed 
stretched. Got him. Good bit of bowling from Headley. Got him. That was quick. Well, just when we think the game's drifting towards the Australians, the Englishmen fight back. And Healy's gone for a duck. Headley's done the trick again. That's pretty straight. And this time, gone. Oh, he's got him. He must have him. He has got him. England have won. Well, that is extraordinary. Four hours they've been in the field. It was a great test match. It was something that we needed. Very emotional. I think Gus said to me, hold it together. I remember at the time we said, oh, you know, we're going to celebrate as a team, just the team. When we go back to the hotel, we're going to tell our wives and girlfriends that this is the team, this is our moment, we will have our moment with you. And I think we walked in last. And um, I said to my girlfriend at the time, I said, uh, look, um, you know, the boys have decided they just want an hour of partying on their own. And she burst into tears. I then realised that none of the players had gone back <laughs> under those instructions and were brave enough to tell their missus. <laughs> so I went, well, that's brilliant, that is. So, but anyway, we ended up partying and, and, it, and it went on to the early hours. I look back on my career that, although it was shortened through injury, I never felt I didn't get anywhere because of my colour. One of the things, though, that I will tell you that I think that they thought I was soft. And actually, I'm not soft. I'm, I'm, I bowl my overs, I bowl long spells. What we do is hard work, and you can't push the boundaries every single day. The guy I played cricket with for a very long time, we probably played together 10, 12 years. And he said, Dev, I really can't believe what we used to get away with as banter. We've got kids the same age. He said, I would be bloody horrified if my kids speak to your kids the way I used to speak to you. And I said, thank God. There's a white guy seeing it now. He said, I didn't see myself as racist. We go out for dinners, we do things, we have a few drinks together and all that business. But he said, I look back at it now and said, you guys must have found it bloody hard. You didn't fight back, you didn't say much, you laugh it off and whatever but I can see how that probably wore you down. We've spoken about so many aspects of this journey which are, are difficult and they're difficult for so many reasons because you come from a different background, because of the lack of understanding from your skin colour to people's preconceived ideas and all of those things has, has a toll. The idea that others may think that you are less, it cuts deep into every person. Yet, in spite of all those things, the chance to do what you want to do and to experience that and to experience the joy of that. And I would even say that if there's difficulty on that road and yet you achieve, it adds even more joy to it. Let somebody say you can't do it and then go and do it and see how much more fun it is. You would think, given the way the country was changing, and given the increased presence of black cricketers in the England team throughout the 90s, that the numbers would just continue to rise. Perhaps I simply took it for granted that they would. Perhaps we all did. History is written by the conqueror, not by those that are conquered. Got him! That was quick. Mark Butcher is through to his hundred. We need to go back and teach both sides of history. The 90s had seen a number of standout performances from black England cricketers, and in 2001, it was my turn. There it goes, it's away to the boundary. 
England have won the fourth test match here at Headingley. And they need to thank Mark Butcher, who finishes 173 not out. He's loved it. My life would never be the same again. But since the turn of the century, there's been a 75% decline in the number of black British professional cricketers, from 33 in the mid-90s to just nine in the county championship today. There are, you know, a myriad of reasons for this. It's not quite as a simple story. You know, clearly the reduction of cricket in schools in urban areas plays a big part. That is where um, the black population is at its greatest. Well, that's lovely. Since Mark Butcher retired from Test cricket, the only black British man to have played Test cricket is Michael Carberry. Growing up in the 80s and 90s in South London, it could be a rough neighbourhood from time to time. There was a lot of social issues going on and you virtually had two options. You make something of yourself or you go to jail. So cricket was actually, for me, a way out. Street cricket, the dustbin was the stumps. You put down a jumper or whatever it was, running bowl, it's in the road. You know, cars come, we'll step to the side. You know, if you hit it over a house, six and out. You know, if you miss it more than three times, you're out. You know, it was, it was brutal and the adults didn't care. They just saw kids out there having fun, enjoying themselves, not causing any trouble whatsoever, just enjoying playing sport. I was very lucky that I had a, a cricket mad father. Dad is uh, one of the founders of a, a wandering West Indian club called Castletonians, which was um, started up in a pub in Wandsworth. We don't have a ground, but we've produced some very, very talented players in our time. Uh, the Tudor brothers being, being more recognised. On a Sunday, they would take a bus. All the families would get in there, you know, the rice and peas, the chicken, everything in a flask. We'll play football, we'll play cricket, and you're just mixing with other kids. It was fantastic. Seeing my dad play loud music, that sort of engrossed my love for the great game. That was my first real introduction to cricket. I didn't get it massively because I was one where, not because I was, I was big, but no one really sort of stepped out of line. There were, there were things that would happen. I played a under-19 game and I remember I walked into the change room in the morning and the coach, I'm not going to mention the name, was Tudes, um, my car got broken into um, and my radio got stolen. You must have it. And I'm like, excuse me? I was 17 or so at the time and um, all the rest of the lads are laughing and I'm like, lads, it's not funny, what is it? What, because I'm the only black guy um, that he's saying this? And then I was like having it out with this coach. I was like, you, you can't say that, that's out of order. Why? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm born in England, you know, I'm representing England. Why are, you, why are you coming at me like that? And he's like, all right, calm down, you know, take that chip off his shoulder, digging a bigger hole for him. So I'm like, so I, was, I said, listen, if this would have been a different time, like you would have said this to me possibly in London or something, I would have swung at you. And I would most probably jeopardise my chances of representing England and, and going further, I would have been most probably said, I'm a, I'm a, I have a problem, I have an issue, I'm too aggressive. Once that happened, I was like, OK, I'm not really checking for you if that's, that's, that's your thoughts. It was really probably around 15 or 16 that I actually had my first taste of it, playing for England, schoolboys. I can't remember what my statistics were that year for Surrey, but I was in the clouds and then there was daylight and then there was the rest. And there was a World Cup, I believe, 1996. When the team was picked, I mean, I, I think I played, ended up playing only one game for the whole tournament. I was just ignored for the whole tournament. And the reasons that were given at that time was that, oh, every time we see you, you're talking to the opposition too much. I couldn't wait to get home from that tournament. And I've never, ever, had a feeling like that from cricket. You know, even if the day didn't go well, I didn't make runs or had a bad day or whatever. You know, I never felt, I don't want to go back. But that was the first time that actually hit me that they just don't like me for some reason. Why? I what, what did I do? That same coach, 10 years after that, came and actually apologised for his behaviour 
But this time now I'm on an England, about to go on an England A tour or, or an England Lions tour. I shook him by the hand. I shook him by the hand because I said, listen, mate, it takes a real man to come and say sorry. So respect. But what I will say is also thank you. Because it was at that, that moment you unearthed Michael Carberry, the real cricketer. You know, because I realise now how mentally strong I have to be to be able to climb over things like this to keep achieving. <laughs> For today's players, a whole new problem has emerged. During their careers, Chris Jordan and Jofra Archer have both been subjected to racist abuse online, a sadly familiar problem for black people in professional sport, as we were reminded once more when England lost the final of the European Championships. When the first two, Sancho and Rashford, missed, and then Saka stepped up to kick, the first thought in your head was, but if this doesn't go right, almost exactly, you almost could read exactly what was going to happen and exactly that transpired. To be honest, it was so predictable. You could see it coming from a mile away as well. I was lucky enough to be at the ground, so I knew how I felt when the first penalty missed and the second and then the last. So you feel that you have a personal connection to it. As well, obviously, being I've, I myself has I've been in a final, high pressure final, been trusted with pretty much the match defining moment. If England didn't win the 50 over World Cup, I probably would have taken a long, nice break away from cricket, away from England as well, probably. Because the week after that, I couldn't go anywhere without being recognised. On the flip side, if I lost, who knows what would have happened, could have been abused every time I stepped up my house. I have had a little bit of backlash um, and it's nothing that I've actually, uh, funny enough, spoken up about. Um, for the mere fact that you sort of feel like, well, you don't want any sympathy first and foremost because you want, you want to be able to get the job done and you want your skills to, to speak and say everything they need to say, um, but it doesn't make it right. There is obviously things that can be done. Uh, it's well documented. Um, the measures that a lot of the social media companies can put in place to even sort of um, stamp it out. But even us as human beings, um, it's more about the education, um, look into the history, um, check um, the things that have gone on in the past, the things that even a lot of black people in itself have been pioneers of you know, and it might actually surprise you. Are you ready? I noticed as soon as I walked into the world of cricket, the comments started. <sighs> One sec. The summer of 2020 was extraordinary for any number of reasons. And when cricket finally returned to our screens, the sport and indeed the entire country witnessed something truly remarkable on the subject of racism from Michael Holding and Ebony Rainford Brent. I was grateful to, to Sky for putting that piece on because, you know, ugh, I didn't think cricket wanted to hear that. Especially on the first day back to cricket after we were cricket starved, I was thinking, oh my God, this is going to go down like a lead balloon. They keep on telling me there is nothing called white privilege. Give me a break. I don't see any white people going into a store on Oxford Street and being followed. A black man walks in, somebody's following him everywhere he goes. That is basic white privilege. Whether that white person went in to rob the place or not, is not going to be thought of that way. And things like that have to change. I happened to turn the TV on that morning just as that segment was starting and it literally gave me goosebumps. I remember I had training not too long after and, and the buzz I had going into training after seeing and hearing something so powerful, he just hit the nail on its head. We all felt it. We all felt what he felt. We've all experienced it. We've all been there. I find it quite amusing how people reacted. And, now, and I, as a black man, thinking, really? You didn't know that? 
You didn't know when I walk into a shop, the security guy's gonna follow me. You don't know when I hold down a taxi in the middle of London, about 50 will, walk, will drive past me. Really? Nobody knows that happens. Are you serious? I would have liked that interview sooner. There's nothing to be afraid of. But I appreciate that in his own mind, that, and this is what racism can do to people, it does create that fear about speaking out because you don't want to be perceived to be that guy or that troublemaker. You know, you've got to think about life after cricket, naturally, like we all do. My view on this is that historically, if I look at just from my tender years on this planet, what opportunities have ever been open for any of us after, after playing? So what's there to be frightened of? Take the story of Mark Elaine, the only black British coach in the history of the county game. As a player, Elaine captained Gloucestershire to nine trophies in seven years and was appointed head coach in 2004, winning two more trophies in that time. But in 2007, the club decided that a change was needed. I think the official line is we wanted a new direction. So I did regroup a little bit and I thought I wanted to focus on coaching, which eventually took me down to, to Lords MCC and I did seven years there um, uh, doing the young cricketers and getting them back into the first class game. I mean, a lot of people might have, might have found that their, their ego was too stung to kind of to take that step backwards. Mm. Was that ever the case for you? The move was very um, <clears throat> um, important for me and I saw it as a, as a stepping stone back into first class and hopefully international level. So mm. I thought I'd be there for three years max. Uh, I mean, I didn't even move home. And that is when the reality kicked in a bit, when the opportunities just didn't arise. How many interviews would you have, would you have gone to? The only interview I got was for the England women's job, um, which I was shortlisted. It's when Mark Robinson got appointed, but I didn't get any county interviews. Well, the idea that you cannot get an interview, mm. even with your CV, mm. seems extraordinary. Yeah. I mean, I thought about it a lot. And I, I do think it's because of race, but I don't think it's because people hate black people. I just don't think we've got enough presence as a coaching group to give people the confidence that you can do a good job say like an, an Aussie coach can come over with a really good reputation, sometimes irrespective of what they've done, but they, they seem to have this reputation, you see Because it. other Aussie coaches have other, come over uh, and been good, yeah. Yeah, and they, they're mm. kind of hanging on the back of maybe other overseas coaches that have done well. And I do feel, that without knowing, that sometimes when people see black coaches, they, they, they don't see them necessarily as high performance people coming into your environment and making a difference. And that's what we need to change. We need to change that lens. Would you coach professionally? Would you go into that world? I'll be honest with you. I'm gonna spend a hell of a lot of money getting a qualification that honestly, I'm not gonna be able to do anything with. When you talk about being the person that you can see, any black player, any black cricketer who thinks that there might be a career for them in coaching, looking to see where they might find a mentor, where they might find someone who's been there and done it, there isn't anyone. And that, to be quite honest, is scandalous. For me, there still hasn't been an admission of guilt from the top. You cannot have the same kind of people in the same kind of positions. Or worst of all now, this internal investigation process. And these investigations never ever give you the, the full analytics of what's going on. Somehow or another, the sport always ends up just smelling sweet enough. The love and passion that the Caribbean community had 
for the game when they first came to the UK was just taken for granted that it would always be there. And actually, if you don't do anything to support it and to, and to feed it, then you end up where we are today. I think it's a problem that has arisen by a lack of action, just a carelessness, actually. A prime example of that carelessness would be the story of Haringey Cricket College. Set up in 1981, the college produced 25 future professional cricketers from its predominantly black intake. But the ECB pulled its funding just over 20 years ago, cutting off a ready-made pathway for black talent. Last summer, the ECB admitted that there aren't nearly enough black people in the game and accepted that this must change. When you start to look at the history of who created the game, it became really obvious that the game is structured in our country to support a certain elite. I think that's why it makes sense that lots of private schools have a good in and they're known for producing great cricketers because that's where the system and the pipelines have been designed from the early days. The independent schools have got a thriving cricket programme which then produces competitive cricket and the better cricketers all head for, for that space. So because in their eyes the best cricketers are there, that's where they look for academy graduates. And I think at times we can be a bit lazy, um, not looking outside that small independent school bubble sometimes uh, for some of our better cricketers. I think there's a lot of beauty in that system, you know, so this is not me sort of saying change that. What it made me realise is we need to design new systems from the ground up to support everybody else getting in. And that's exactly what Ebony has done with the ACE programme. Standing for African-Caribbean engagement, Ebony launched ACE in 2020 with the aim of increasing cricketing opportunities for black youngsters across London. The programme has since become an independent charity, receiving significant financial backing from Sport England and recently opened its doors in Birmingham and Bristol. What was fascinating, we marketed it, and three weeks we had 100 kids turn up. Straight away found a kid that ended up going to play for Surrey 18s. We've got a couple now trialling, and we created an academy. And I think the early success and the excitement from the community made us realise, hold on, it's not that these people aren't engaged, it's actually that we're not, as a sport, doing enough to reach out. It gives me hope to know not only is there a whole load of talent out there, ridiculous amounts of talent, some that's ready to go, some that just needs some support, but equally, there's a whole generation of kids that want to be inspired like we were. And there's a system to be designed to get them all in. Well, a lot of black kids might say, well, look what's happening, like they're getting abused, you know. We don't want to be in that sport because of the stuff that comes off the field or the added pressure. So that's why we're here to pretty much fly the flag, you know, let them know that it can be done. Ebony's doing great work at the ES program, you know, and anything we can do to help Ebony to help them will go a long way. The word I keep coming back to is resilience. The ability to endure and keep getting the best out of yourself, even when the odds are stacked against you. That definition seems to apply to all of the guys and girls I've spoken to, whether born here in the UK or in the Caribbean. I'm sad that at present this generation of black kids appears not to see a path for itself in the great game of cricket and that it seems to have been left up to the black community itself to remedy that situation. But despite the sense that the game may have let them down on occasion or caused them pain, my overriding sense is that almost everyone I spoke to loved their time in the game loved representing their country and given the chance, we'd do it all over again. <laughs>